I'm going to talk now about cardiovascular physiology. And the way that I'll begin is with a very simple diagram of the cardiovascular system. And I'm going to restrict my discussion today to the systemic circulation. So we're going to begin with a heart. And then from the heart, we've got the main artery leaving the heart, which is, of course, the aorta. And that's going to curve down. Here's our aortic arch. Now, I'm not going to draw the anatomy precisely, uh, but what's going to happen is that aorta will divide into arteries, and the arteries will divide in turn into arterioles. The arterioles will then divide into capillaries, so we've got a big capillary bed. And then the blood from the capillaries will be collected up into venules, veins, and ultimately it will go back to the heart. And if we're talking about the return of the blood from the systemic circulation to the heart, it's going back into the right atrium. So I'll define the chamber here as the right atrium. So here's our systemic circulation. Now I'm going to introduce a rather hypothetical concept now. I'm going to imagine that the heart has stopped and the blood has simply redistributed around the systemic circulation. Now obviously in life this would never occur, but we'll just pretend that it has. So it turns out that if the heart does stop, if the blood does redistribute, there will be a pressure in the cardiovascular system and it will be the same pressure everywhere. That pressure is around 7 millimetres of mercury. Of course, you can translate that into kilopascals uh, if you need to using the appropriate formula. Now, the reason that there's a pressure anywhere in the circulation if the heart has stopped is because you've got blood, in effect, within an elastic bag. You can think of all of the blood vessels as being an elastic bag. And it's as if you've just tried to fill that bag with a little bit too much blood. And because it's a little bit overfilled, it stretches the walls, the walls push back on the blood, and we have a little bit of pressure everywhere in the circulation. That's 7 millimetres of mercury, and that's referred to as the mean systemic pressure, or MSP. Now, the mean systemic pressure is the pressure everywhere in the systemic circulation under these circumstances, and it can't vary because if there were a little bit of a gradient, so if one area had a higher pressure than another area, then the blood would simply flow until that was no longer the case. So it all evens itself out until it experiences the same pressure absolutely everywhere. And I'm ignoring the effect of gravity in this case, so perhaps our person is lying down. Now let's imagine that the heart begins to pump now. Now obviously that would never happen in reality, but let's imagine that the heart does begin to pump, and what will happen is that it will take some blood from the venous side, and it will pump that blood into the arterial side. So we can imagine it's transferring, let's say, X millilitres of blood from the veins into the arteries. Now if that happens, the pressure in the arterial side will rise, whereas the pressure on the venous side will fall. What values will it go to? Well, if you imagine a normal average person, we would say that the pressure in the aorta is 120 over 80 millimetres of mercury, and that's our textbook value for arterial blood pressure, systolic over diastolic. Well, 120 over 80, that's because it fluctuates, it moves up and down. But let's take a mean value and use the mean arterial pressure of 95 millimetres of mercury. Now, you might ask, why is the mean arterial pressure not 100? Why isn't it exactly the average of systolic and diastolic? The answer is that the heart spends a little bit longer in diastole. So the sort of time-averaged value for the mean arterial pressure is 95. It's a little bit closer to diastolic than it is to systolic. Now, if you want to calculate what the mean arterial pressure should be, the way you do it is you start with diastolic pressure, and then you add a third of the difference. So it's a third of the way up from diastolic to systolic, which is a useful little calculation to be able to do. So it comes to around 95 millimetres of mercury in my average person. But then let's look at the venous side. And on the venous side, blood has been removed from the venous side by the heart, and as a result, the pressure there has fallen. And physiologists are often interested in right atrial pressure, the pressure in the right atrium, which is going to be very similar to the pressure in the great veins uh, as they empty into the right atrium. And right atrial pressure 
under normal circumstances is around zero millimetres of mercury. That means atmospheric pressure. OK, well, this makes sense to a certain extent because we've taken blood out of the venous side, so the pressure there has dropped. We've put that same amount of blood into the arterial side and stretched it a bit, so the pressure there has gone up. But our starting point was with mean systemic pressure, 7 millimetres of mercury, everywhere in the system. Why is it that when the heart starts pumping, the pressure on the venous side drops from 7 to 0, which is just a drop of 7 millimetres of mercury, whereas on the arterial side, the pressure has risen from 7 to 95, which is a rise of 88 millimetres of mercury. It's the same amount of blood that's been moved, but it seems to have more impact on the arterial side. Well, the reason for this relates to the compliance of the blood vessels. And compliance is defined as delta V over delta P. In other words, the change in volume of a blood vessel in this case for a given change in pressure. On the venous side, the compliance is very high. And that means that you can have a big change in volume for a relatively small change in pressure. You can think of this as being like a floppy bag. The veins are like floppy bags, and that means that you can put blood into them, you can take blood out, but it doesn't change the pressure very much. The bag can just accommodate the differences in volume. But the compliance on the arterial side is very low. The arteries are relatively stiff. They're elastic vessels. They've got a lot of connective tissue in the walls. The walls are very thick. And what that means is if you try to ram a little bit more blood into them, it might only be a small amount of extra blood, but the pressure will rock it up. If the compliance is small, a change in volume translates into a, a large change in pressure. So you move the same amount of blood out of the veins and into the arteries. The result is that the pressure in the veins drops just a little bit to around zero. The pressure in the arteries rises to quite a high value, up to about 95 millimetres of mercury. And of course, what we've achieved by the heart pumping in this way is a pressure gradient. Because the pressure in the arterial side is now high, the pressure on the venous side is now low, that gives us a gradient and that's what pushes the blood around the body. So the heart is generating that pressure gradient. It's generating it ultimately using energy, of course. It needs oxygen, it needs a fuel supply in order to achieve that. But once it's achieved that gradient, blood flows around the circulation. 